Okay, hello listeners, me and Ted are back again. Uh, this podcast is going to be on the missing 411. It was a question asked by appropriate being. So finally we got to it, okay? Uh, Ted, you watched the documentary. What did you think? Well, I saw so many things and, and uh, uh, so much of it came rushing back to me in, in memory and things that Carla had said years ago. Other people that I have heard, it, it just all came rushing back to me. And I have several pages here of little comments and notes that I made uh, to throw in there with this. I, I found it extremely enlightening, uh, fascinating, but frightening at the same time. Yeah. Um, the documentary start now. This is going to be spoilers if someone hasn't seen it okay uh, i thought it was very good as well um i've been listening to david paulitas for maybe 10 years now maybe longer um so i'm happy he's he's made it i've got no criticisms of of the documentary he's done uh, this is his third one in the series um but uh, all of his uh he, for people who wouldn't know who he is uh missing 411 um he's an ex cop and he was approached by people in the park service uh, talking about a number of disappearances that weren't getting media attention. So he started investigating them. OK, and out of like the 7000 cases, he's taken 1500 of people who go missing in national parks under mysterious circumstances. Some of the things he'll look at in, in a case um, will be. Uh, if when the person goes missing, missing, there's no scent from the dogs, or sorry, there's no the dogs can't pick up a scent trail. Um, if a person goes missing near granite, uh, there's a body of water involved. These are what he calls his profile points. Uh, if there's berries involved sometimes, and then uh, boulder fields, so like large rocks basically in a field. And then the cause of death can't be determined. The person has uh, no history of mental health. Um, I think he has a few more, but that's all I can remember for right now. Yeah, you're right. Well, uh, you mentioned uh, the trackers not picking up a scent. And uh, that was one of the first comments I made here, uh, which I'd like to point out to the listeners. Uh, well, if the individual who came up missing was lifted straight up from the spot where they were, as if the UFO, you know, was beaming them up, uh, there wouldn't be a scent to follow beyond that point. Yeah. And, and we right. need to think about that. That's probably why they don't have, they don't find a scent of any kind. Yeah. And, um, and, 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 and let me say this for a lose it. Uh, in some cases, uh, the individuals, you know, feel like they have been put on pause, causing them not to remember anything. Now, uh, I'm talking about uh, where there were other people in close proximity of the missing person as a parent who was out with the child and suddenly they, they turn around, the child's gone. Uh but if it, we have to understand the mechanics here of how these aliens are working, uh, they put everyone there on pause. And, and when they, and they do that, then you're just totally immobile. Everything is shut down and just about all your memory faculties are as well. So then in a second, when they've taken that individual, whoever's with them, they look around and they're not there. They can't believe how someone vanished almost right before their eyes, but this is the way they do it. Yeah. The Huffington post had an article. Um, oh, I'm trying to remember. It was, I think it was called don't be last in line because it seemed that people like what you're talking about, Ted is, you know, the child would either just be behind them and it happens in groups of people as well, where, you know, Bob, he's he's right behind us on the trail, but when they turn around, he's not there anymore. He's just completely right. gone, you know. Right. Uh, but missing four one one, the UFO connection, uh, starts off with Ray Salomon at Harrison Lake, 
he's a hunter. He's well experienced. He's well equipped. Uh, he brings his dogs with him, and uh, he doesn't come home. Okay. Uh, they find his. Uh, he went out there with a a, a camper van. It was sort of like a truck with a uh, kind of structure on the truck. I don't know what you'd call it. Not quite like a van, but like a truck with uh, a sleeping compartment on it. And um, they found that with the dogs locked inside. Is that correct, actually? That, yeah, that that was that's the way they they found the dog still there, and everything was laid out exactly the way he would have done it uh, as he was going to get set up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe I'm just describing the van wrong. Sorry. But anyway, it was a camper van of some sort. Uh, the dogs were locked inside the van. Um, I thought it was pretty uh, eerie when uh, David asked um, Ray's wife, um, why would he lock the dogs in the van? And she said if there was a threat outside. I was like, ooh, what would be a threat? I suppose a bear. A bear yeah. would be a threat to dogs, wouldn't it? Right, yeah, it could be. Yeah, that, probably that would be, unless it was a pack of wolves. Yeah, but, yeah. But it would if, if he had more than one dog, which apparently he did, uh, and and there was only one wolf, I don't think that I don't think that would have worked in that case. So, uh, it was either a pack of wolves or either a bear. Yeah, I think the implication though is that there was some sort of craft outside, like a UFO, and that's why he locked his dogs in. Right. Um, but any, anyway, at some point, uh, he went off. He left the van because they never found him there. But search and rescue found like his clothes, uh, hundreds of meters away from the van. They found his rifle and clothes next to a shore, um, and the whole the the wife was saying that the the rescue guys were trying to get convince her that he drowned in the water. And they're trying to push push her to that conclusion. But she felt like they were holding information back and they weren't being truthful. And then also they found this pistol in a completely different direction, uh, inland. Um, and there was no explanation for that. And also there was a uh, part of the search and rescue was uh, like a SWAT team. Uh, it's, it's called an emergency response team where these guys show up armed. Um, and I because there was a ufo reported in the area like uh i don't know if it was that night or a few nights ago all those files then get sent to they take it seriously they all go to uh, some other department that no one knows anything about but it is collected well uh, first of all the, the, the i got the impression from uh his wife that uh the uh RCMPs, uh, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, uh, that they were, I, I kind of got the feeling they were intentionally trying to direct her, her thinking towards him being lost at the bottom of this lake or, or that he drowned and they just couldn't find his body. Uh, something about all that didn't sit well with me. And I'm talking about, I had a strong psychic feeling that they had more information that they've never released. Yeah. And, and that really they were trying to direct her thoughts away from it being alien involvement or abduction or, or, or anything of that nature. Yeah. Now, yeah. Now why? Uh, I don't. I have no idea. I, I don't have any feeling on that. But but I do not believe they were truthfully honest with his wife. Yeah, that's the impression I got as well. Uh, these disappearances as well. Okay, uh, I'm gonna quote David from one of his books. Uh, he says, uh, the, the, basically they find clusters of disappearances in certain areas. Okay, but if like let's say it happens in Yosemite. Then a couple of months later, it'll happen in a different location, and then a couple of months later in another location, and then a couple of months later, it'll be it'll happen again back in Yosemite. Um, but David says that disappearances occur at such intervals as not to cause alarm to law enforcement, yet do show a consistent pattern. And these patterns, 
uh, I suppose I won't spoil the ending just yet, like because but he, I think he makes a big discovery at the yeah. end. Um, but that's Ray, okay? That's Ray's story. That's how this uh documentary starts off. Then it uh it leads into the elk connection. All right. Ted, what did you think of the elk connection? Because I'm not too sure about this one. Like my my feeling is that they're not particularly interested in elk, but that this is what's kind of happening to like all the animals. What did you think? Well, yeah, I have the same direction you're going, but with, with uh, more uh, tangents to get out on here with it. Uh, yes, I think that uh, the creatures uh, feed the alien creatures that we have seen and observed as as, uh, the Bigfoot. uh, They feed off of of deer and elk and what have you. And there are probably other creatures, Stuart and Bob, that we don't even know about uh, that are involved with these aliens and these crafts. Uh, so yes, they feed on it in that sense of the word. But to me, I saw this elk situation. Uh, well, let me just read some of my notes here. Uh, I said I, I, I got down here in my note. Notice that when the elk was lifted, it didn't make any sound that the human workers nearby heard. Likewise, when a person is abducted, other humans right next to them do not recall any cry for help. This is because you are suddenly incapacitated and are helpless outside of of some uh, mental awareness you may still maintain. It is as if you were put on pause like a computer. And I have suggested in the past that our brains are like biological computers and that they react accordingly like a computer does. So they have equipment, in my opinion, what I'm saying here, that uh, that when they zap us with that energy field, you know, it shuts everything down just like you pause your computer. And it maintains right there, basically, uh, un- until they release it. And then they, they have the ability to do whatever they want to with us. We're totally helpless. And in, in the case with this elk, I think that's why it was not moving. It wasn't kicking, trying to get away. It wasn't making any noises uh, whatsoever. So I, I, I would like for everybody to take all that into consideration. And in another regards, they found a few days later what uh, they believed was the uh, remains of this elk. And it had a, it, after medical examination and pathology reports, uh, it had a zombie deer disease or mad cow disease. Uh, also known as a prion disease. And now that tells me something else. I'm going to bring up the past here with Barbara Barthlick. Years ago when I worked with Barbara, and uh, Carla Turner was aware of this also, uh, Barbara had a number of cases in which abductees had some disease in which they were slowly being wasted away. Under hypnosis, the abductee reported that their abductions were the aliens monitoring the progression of their disease or death. Monitoring the the individual's rate of death is is, is not that uncommon with people that have uh, terminal illnesses. Uh, The longer the individual suffered, the greater the reward for the alien. That was Barbara's... uh, she was leaning in that direction with her thinking, and I I do the same thing. Uh, notice that none of none of these uh, cases with Barbara or other were cured of any disease. They were simply monitored, and 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 Barbara said that starting they would start abducting young boys 
or girl as early as nine or 10 years old that were sl slipping around smoking or doing some drugs. And they, instead of doing anything to help steer these children away from that, they, they continued abducting them and studying them and monitoring their progression all throughout their life until finally that disease took their lives and, or destroyed it totally. So I, I wanted to refer this back to the elk. I'm not so sure that this elk was taken for food. If he had this mad cow disease, I'm thinking that they were studying the progression of this elk's demise. It's part of their own research program. I guess you might want to say just to see how many miles they'll get out of this. And did they implement this disease into this herd of elk or was it, or did nature do it? We don't know for sure, but I suspect that they Create, created the disease among this particular herd and that they periodically took one of them to simply monitor it and see how long you might say to see how many miles they can get out of it right so uh anyway those are my thoughts on that and i just uh wanted to throw that in here yeah i didn't think yeah uh, because uh i think the guy who who was talking about the elk was peter davenport and he was saying that when they found it, there was no like incision or cuts. It didn't sound like the animal had been mutilated, like you would typically get with the uh, cow, right. cattle. Uh, there was no blood taken. Uh, the animal was largely intact. They even went as far as to say that it was it wasn't even shot by a hunter. Um. So yeah, I, I don't think it was for food either because immediately I'm thinking, well, why? If they did take the elk, why wasn't it mutilated? Well, normally, that's what would happen, as with the cows. But they take a lot of the bovine simply because they want the parts to use in their cloning procedures. Yeah, but, yeah. Uh, but with the elk, I, I would say elk and deer, usually if they are taken uh, and you just found a mutilated carcass after after it was taken, they probably are feeding off from it. But in this particular case, I just felt an entirely different process going on here. Yeah. What I was saying before as well, like I felt that like, I know we know about the cattle mutilations, but I think those mutilations happen to all animals. I don't think it's just cattle. I think, I think we just happen to notice cattle more. Um, because it's livestock and it's property and it gets reported um, but if out in the wild I think the mutilations happen to all different types of animals um, I, I think I remember reading a story about a hunter who came across like over 500 deer who had all been mutilated and drained the blood that's that's an old story though like, I don't know right. yeah uh, yeah, yeah. I, I had I had also uh, heard of that too, Stuart. Yeah, time ago, right? I've forgotten about that. Um, there was a, uh, and also that the, the cats that were turning up dead there for a while. It's probably still going on as well. Like half cats. Linda Moulton Howe reports on that quite a bit. Uh, but like what she's saying is that like it seems to be more sinister than, yeah. Uh, like there was a a veterinarian who used to go out and investigate like these half cats turning up and then it that it happened to his cat and he felt that it was a uh, uh, a malevolent force had done it purpose purposefully um but yeah I think the with the the elk I think that's a good shout that it, it is probably studying that disease and that disease well, is all, all over North America. Well, it well it is, and 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 if they're studying this in the animals, and uh, as as uh, the researcher told us, uh, in some of the European countries, uh, mad cow disease actually transferred into humans, and a lot of humans died of that disease. Uh, so I I suspect uh, since I. Uh, have observed the nature of these aliens and I don't see that they're 
uh, at, at this point, I don't really see that uh, most of them that are doing abduction work, et cetera, leaving uh, benevolent trails or what have you, they, they're doing all of this for our best interests. They're doing it for self-serving themselves. And that, that makes me think, that they would implement diseases in the animals and see how well it does. And they study the progression and, and, uh, and then they transfer this to humans uh, because human suffrage is it to the negative aliens. That's a very important thing of their being. Uh, the energy off of, of human suffrage it seems to be extremely important to these aliens. And, and we have to think about that as we uh, consider what all they're doing in our lives and how they're participating with us on this planet. Yeah. Uh, because I don't see, a, 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 or, or at least they're not showing uh, in a way that I can see that they're doing a lot of good for us in any ways. Maybe they are, and, and I'm not aware of it, but I'd sure like to see some of it. Yeah. But I think, I think they have the ability to, uh, well, just, just uh, look at it like this. I know from personal experience and other people that they are doing cl human cloning. And uh, when they do human cloning, then, you know, as, as uh, uh, one of these uh, abductees here in, in the uh, Missing 401, he uh, had some severe uh, tuberculosis scars in his lungs. But when he came back and they did x-rays and studied him, those scars were not there. Well, that indicates to me he's he's been cloned. Oh, uh, yeah, okay. Yeah, I, I, because where would they go? Is this... Now, is, now, is this... Would they, did they, did they, did they uh, clone him to cure him? Uh, he didn't say that those scars were going to take his life. They were just scars from a cured disease. Uh, so I don't think they did it for his benefit at all. I think they cloned him, used his the, the products of his body for whatever they needed for their own uh, substance. And then they put him back, as with many cases of many abductees, they're cloned and put, put back. Now, uh, this, this is um, Carl Higdon we're talking about, isn't it? Yes, right. He, he's one of the abductees in the in this uh, study that yeah done. and uh, he he thinks he was returned because he had a vasectomy right well th 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 hey th they t uh they have taken women that have been infertile and 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 had them have babies so that they can take the babies the fetuses from them uh the fact that carl had had a vasectomy means nothing to them yeah, None okay. whatsoever, and and they could just have cloned another one of him. They uh, they could have taken the DNA and recloned him, uh, and kept uh, uh, it kept all the byproducts anyway. Yeah, uh, yeah, you know, for for their own procedure. So to me, that was uh, an intentional screen memory lie that they implanted on him for him to think that. Yeah, yeah. Now for all the listeners who've like listened to all the episodes here. I'd like I'm, we're kind of starting to build like a picture of uh, these screen memories. That's how I feel anyway. So Carl Higdon, he gets abducted by a group of aliens who don't look like you look like your typical alien. Uh, they have like uh, oddly shaped heads and then their left arm is just a cone. Like it's right. not even there's not even a hand at the end of it, you know, but then the other arm is fine. Uh, now, when I saw that straight away, I was like, "Well, obviously, like that's not what these beings look like." Ted, is that was that your impression as well? No, uh, the ones that I recall seeing, even the reptilians, had some type of uh, a, a a paw or hand like with you know with digits. I don't, I don't, rem I know the greys as I remember did not have five like we do on our hands, but. Uh, they had three, maybe could have been four. I'm not, I don't remember exactly. 
but it was different than our hands. Yeah, but like these. But I didn't see any cone shaped thing. I think that's just. Uh, that's a screen memory. That's a screen memory. He he just wasn't able to break through and see the whole thing. Unfortunately for himself. Yeah, yeah, and then being returned because of the vasectomy, and right, uh, he, he had communication with these beings as well, t- telling them they come down and take what they want. That's true. Now, and then, uh, and let me point out something else. That since we're on Carl's case, I didn't mean to jump ahead uh, here. Excuse me for doing that. But uh, Carl told the investigators that this alien wore this suit uh, because he could not handle sunlight. He had he had to wear this suit to protect himself from sunlight. Now, I just wanted to throw some coincidentals in here, okay? All right. We know, or I know, because I've seen it firsthand, that these aliens, particularly the greys, are after blood. They live off of blood, off of humans or animals, as far as I can tell and understand at this point. Now, doesn't that com- make you think somewhat of the nature of a vampire and and, and uh, the stories we have that are passed on on our planet about vampires that can't be in the sunlight because the sun burns them? Yeah. Uh, they live off of blood. Can't you see here that the truth in all of this goes way back to whenever these stories begin to originate? by people that were being abducted yeah yeah that's what i always thought about vampires as well is that had some kind of connection to the ufo phenomena well sure sure to me it seems pretty obvious he then um moves on to uh oh here's an interesting fact as well i I just took it down um uh in pennsylvania okay pennsylvania is considered a big cluster okay so between 1934 to 1957, a lot of children went missing. And then there was an 11-year gap where no one went missing. And then it started up again. But when it started up again, the people who were going missing were slightly older. I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it doesn't surprise me because we got to deal with the fact that th- these aliens, they use us as an energy source, a food source. Uh, they do all kind of, of psychological experimentation with us, not for our benefit, uh, unless it's some way to, to uh, enrich their, their harvest supply. But I feel that the, these aliens are doing this for their own self-serving benefit. So whatever happened there in Pennsylvania uh, was a shift in that program. Yeah, yeah. They, they made some alteration in that program. They got what they needed for a while. And then it all died down for a number of years. And then bingo. It starts back, but this time with adults. Yeah. So uh, I see it as all uh, things in their program that we have no idea of what is. Yeah, but there's obviously a shift. We right. We don't know what they're after other than food. Uh, we don't know why. We don't have enough information. But I definitely see it as uh, something to do with the aliens program for that area of what they're doing. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, yeah, they, uh, missing four, one document we've mentioned Ray, Ray Salomon, uh, the elk connection. And now he ties in UFOs with Chris Baylor and Rob Zinker. Okay. They were basically out and they saw a triangular craft up in the air. Okay. And it's in this area of where these people are going missing. Um, so these same hunters, one of them knew uh, another hunter who went missing 53 years ago. His name was Ray Jones. And every time they went out looking, out hunting, they were looking for Ray as well. All right. But when they saw that triangular 
shaped UFO. That year, Ray's body was then found in in a boulder field. Right. After 53 years, he just appeared. And Ted, this is a huge question that I have is um so obviously we have aliens who are abducting people and they're being cloned and then returned. But why aren't these people being cloned? Why are they just being taken and then uh not turning up, or if they are turning up, they're turning up dead? Well, I, I can only speak hypothetically, of course, because I don't know uh I don't know the uh the details in the program. Uh I would say a lot of it has to do uh it has to do with maybe the particular type of alien that takes them because there's more there's more than one kind as we know there are there are grays doing abduction there are aliens uh, that are, are reptiles uh they're the praying mantis uh they're and they're the nordics and uh, it, they're all basically alien and they're in some type of confederacy in which each one knows what the other one seems to be doing i i don't think they're really at odds with each other but they each one operates their programs a little bit differently so we're talking about a different group i would say yes because usually the same group follows the same pattern yeah and isn't it interesting that all these cases that we're we're mentioning one of the similarities that they have is that they're of German descent. Right. And yeah. And I wanted, I wanted to uh, make a comment on that as well. Uh, yeah. I, I found that very interesting that they were all German. And now I just want to uh, make some comparison here. Uh, maybe I'm, I'm getting off on a tangent. It's not taking us anywhere, but just remember those of you that have, uh, uh, listen to earlier tapes that Stuart and I have done. I saw in Dulce, New Mexico, abductions being performed by Nordic alien human looking men wearing the German swastika insignia on their uniforms. They were slaughtering humans for blood, food, and energy. Why? They're going after the negative behavior as well as the nutrition from the bodies, uh, the sustenance they get from the blood. Uh, negative behavior is a big energy maker for these aliens. Yeah. And I have personally seen the instruments they use to put, uh, uh, it, it, it looks like some weird, strange help they put over your head with little hoses running and when they all start operating this it sucks those different levels of energy right out of our aura and totally cleans it out yeah and so uh i don't want to get off on a tangent here but i just want everybody to think about uh you know these nordics and their association with dulce new mexico and they wore German swastikas. And we know that what happened in Germany in World War II and the swastika, what it represented, was the most negative thing in history that we are aware of. Yeah, and and, and what a banquet they what a banquet they must have gotten. Yeah. So I think it's pretty clear that these these crafts that are taking people in these clusters are Nordic. That's what I'm trying to say. I suspect that they are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's there that we've identified the race. You can kind of see uh why the German descent kind of falls into it. But why why would it matter if they are German descent? Well, oh, that's that's kind of hard for me to explain. I, I I wish I were. I wish I had a PhD for you people where I could really tell you in a very intelligent level what I know sometimes. But here, I want to do my best in Ted's way. These aliens, back from the very beginning of time, biblical times, 
throughout our planet. They came here. I'm not sure that they didn't actually originate here in the very beginning. And I, I have said before, I'm suspicious that the one true alien race that came here was the one we know of as God that, that the Bible talks about in, in the angels. But it spread out from there where different leaders spun off from this and created different groups or races of people. Uh, all right, the German Nordics created these uh, Nordic looking human hybrids. Okay, then you move to another part of, of the world and there is a conflict with another leader and they created the Jewish race. And they're at odds with each other, but yet the program, they overlap. Each one knows what the other one's doing. It's very complicated and it's so hard for we humans to understand how they operate that way. But that is what they're doing. You know, that's why you have so many different religions throughout the planet is, is these, these different alien leaders set themselves up in the beginning of the planet and created their own human races and they're doing their own programs which they're feeding off the humans just like they're feeding off of us here in europe and in and, and the united states uh am i making any sense to it at all uh i think we'll have a little, to come back. maybe a little bit a little bit i think we'll have to come back to this one though at a later time okay yeah i don't i don't want to get lost in it but that's why, that's why you have the conflict of these different ones in the Nordics and, and what have you, because you've got different leaders here and there doing different things with their own program, but it's still all part of the major school system. Yeah. Uh, I'm really intrigued by that, but we're going to have to get through this and uh, we'll come back to that topic because it is very intriguing, very interesting. At a uh, at probably on the next podcast, maybe. Um, okay, so he also had an FBI agent called uh, John D'Souza. And to be honest, I was surprised for uh, an ex FBI agent to basically admit on camera that extra dimensional beings are real mm -hmm. and that uh, what we're seeing is people going missing is that they're just being taken into these other dimensions. Um, especially someone who uh he made uh he made the point of saying that he's like been in over a hundred court cases where he has been considered an expert so david Polly, this is obviously establishing his credibility and then this guy he was involved in uh the 1994 trade center bombing uh 911 uh the Un unabomber so to have him on there saying that extra dim dimensional um beings are real, but then you know there's people in the mainstream who are still scratching their head about some balloons getting shot down. Did you see that in the news, Ted? The balloons. Yeah, there's been how many now? Four. Four. You know, yeah. back in back in the day, UFOs were referred to as weather balloons, and now today, weather balloons are referred to as UFOs. But you can kind of right. see, you can kind of see how the, you know, all right. So, I wasn't even going to talk about these balloons, but I feel like I have to say it. Like, so when that first uh, Ch Chinese spy balloon was spotted, uh, it was pictures of it, video of it, um, wall to wall media coverage. It was obviously a balloon. It was moving slowly. They said it was balloon. All right, and then these other objects all of a sudden they're being very quiet about and they're acting like they're calling them UFOs. You can kind of see the switch here. They kind of, I think at some point somebody realized, oh, this can actually be beneficial to us for our narrative here when we're talking about UFOs. Because obviously there's a lot of push in, in Congress at the moment right, in the, in the see, United I States. Them doing, yeah, I can see that clearly. So you can see like how open and uh, transparent it all is to then with these other balloons, all of a sudden it becomes secretive. 
and it's they're they're, they're calling them cylindric cylindrical objects you know here listen folks if these guys are shooting down ufos i'd be actually impressed all right they're not they're just shooting down balloons but they're acting as if like they don't know where they came from. I even there was actually an article in the BBC I read five minutes before starting the podcast where uh some US general saying we're not ruling out extraterrestrials. That was in the BBC. <laughs> so <laughs> you can see the switch happening already, you know. But anyway, they're listen, they're just balloons, folks. Yeah, but but uh here's my take on this. The the aliens that we deal with in these UFOs that, that we've been reporting on for years, people have been seeing the military, they're so highly advanced that I'm not saying an accident couldn't happen, but to, I think it would be very rare that they would set themselves up to be shot down unless they wanted that as part of their a new program they're instrumenting into humanity uh so i don't i don't i, I can't go along with the, with the governments now saying they're shooting down ufos yeah it may be an un- unidentified balloon but it's not your typical ufo that, that we're used to reading about or seeing yeah so i to me there's something amiss in all of this yeah, that's it. Like, I, you can just see how the narrative is being manipulated. Because yeah. What's going on? But deliberately. Yeah. Uh, okay, so um, another guy who um, David Pallese talked about is Reinhard Kutchner, who was a physicist. Uh, again, he went he went missing. A UFO was spotted in the area. And it was actually included in the missing person report because the police thought it would be credible. Uh, oh, here's another interesting one that he talks about. It was Mark Stripmiter. Uh, so he's out, he's gone elk hunting. And at some point he stops his car because he sees a bull. And uh, he goes after it, okay? He texts his girlfriend and says, basically he's on his way back. He missed the bull, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but he never makes it home. So she goes out looking for him, finds the car with his keys, his smokes, his phone, all in the car, except for him and his rifle. Uh, I think the thing with the car was interesting because, do you know when you talk about someone being put on pause? Right. I think that he was, he did make it back to his car, but at some point he saw a UFO over the road stopped his car to get out, picked up his gun, and then that was it. He was never seen again. True. That was the end of it. Well, I, I, he's one of the Germans. He's one of the German men. Yeah. Okay. Wouldn't you think that if these Nordics are abducting these men, one of the reasons that uh, that they may not be returning these men. It's a fact that because of of that German bloodline that they're trying to preserve, and these men, by this particular Nordic group, they could be being taken to some other planet and to to use as a breeding machine. Uh, we don't know the full scope of their program as to why these men were not returned, but I suspect that it's connected uh, for for genetic purposes. Yeah, not food purposes. Right, and then and then also uh, we don't want to forget here. It was said earlier, and I was going to touch on it. Now I got the sidetracked. Uh, was that weather events played a big role in uh, these abduction cases? Immediately, almost after each one of them, some some a weather event happened that almost totally shut down the search party for a yeah. few days, like blizzards or storms or, or or what have you. Well, that indicates to me, and I have said in earlier podcasts that I feel reasonably certain that these aliens have the ability to control weather. Yeah. And if they wanted this search interrupted, what better way to do it than than uh, uh, create some weather event that would stop it? 
Yeah, and to be honest, the weather thing is confusing to me as well because if you've just taken someone in, in your ship and you know that they're they're not going to find the, the the rescuers aren't going to find this person, then why would you bother with the whole weather events? <clears throat> That's a good question. And I don't know that I know the yeah, answer. Like, why would you I, go through I, the I hassle can, of it? Yeah, I, I, it doesn't make sense that they would do that to us. However, we don't know that they had decided at that point uh, if they were going to return the individual or not. And maybe, you know, as in with uh, Travis Walton, yeah, uh, in his story, you know, he they they had him him about five days, wasn't it? Yeah, five days, Se- several days before they actually released him somewhere. Uh, th- that was, and people were out searching, but there were they also had a weather event, I believe, that uh, uh, occurred there. I may be wrong, but I'm thinking they did. But but maybe they need a few days of cloning and what have you before they fully decide in some cases whether or not they want to release this human. Yeah, so they're buying might, time. Right. And if they release it, it might be on how well they are able to create these screen memories and block his memories. Okay. So, you know, there's just a whole bunch of reasons here. We don't have enough information to, to you know, make a sound judgment as to yeah. why they what they do. Okay. Now, at the very end of the documentary, all right, this is the big reveal, folks. All right. So, do you remember at the start, we said that one of the profile points was that the person goes missing next to a, a body of water? Right. Or that the victim is found close to a body of water? So, uh, there's an underground water system in this area of where people go missing called an aquifer. Okay, yeah, but it's, it's the Akalala. Akalala. Mm-hmm. The Akalala Aquifer is not what it is, right? So, these people are going missing around lakes, uh, around rivers which are all connected to this aquifer. He thinks that the UFOs are using the aquifers to get around. They're coming up out of lakes. They're taking people, disappearing back into the lakes. Ted, have you ever heard anything like that before? Right at the moment, no, but uh, that doesn't surprise me because we know uh, you know, uh, they're seeing uh, the, our U.S. Navy, they see them out in the ocean, going under the ocean, and uh, there's suspicion that there is an underground base in, in our oceans in different locations. So it depends upon this group. You know, uh, uh, making reference back to my uh, visitation with uh, the alien girl named Maya, Okay, they lived in caves deep in the mountains, but that was her particular group. All right, who's to say these Nordics are not living and coming in and out of these aquifers? It's just, uh, you know, we have to know which group is doing what. Yeah. Does, um... so I, I can see, you know, I mean, and look, uh, and I've said it before, I don't want to get sidetracked, but just think about it in, in the, uh, uh, the Bible, the story of, of uh, uh, who was it? Jonah and the whale. Okay. Jonah was supposedly swallowed by a whale and taken under the, the ocean and was there for a few days before yeah. he was released. You know, uh, I mean, goodness gracious to me, that that just is is nothing but alien abduction right there by uh, by a craft that goes underwater. So their abilities to do this uh, is just limitless. There's apparently like it's supposed to be like a a trans medium craft. It's like something that can fly in the air and then go underwater. Um, But I think uh, David's really found something here with the. Because, folks, the, the uh, if you look at the geological area where this aquifer is, right in the center of the aquifer, there's no people going missing. 
it's just around the edges and oh my god i can't believe i nearly missed this one i know that was very interesting yeah uh there was a guy who the aliens told them to dig a well do you remember this one ted where uh, uh, oh yeah i do and, and he, I, all the scientists and geologists said you're crazy they won't find any water there yeah and then he found water and the aliens told him to dig, dig the well because of uh an, an impending disaster where people were going to need fresh water and that's right. why he had to dig it um and that was in in the in around this aquifer wasn't at the edge now, but there's no reports of missing people where where uh, this guy was asked to dig the well. Mm -hmm. uh, I also looked up uh, the skept uh, Skeptic Inquirer just to see what they said about David, uh, David Paulides' theories. Uh, now, you can imagine it's, they're not too impressed at all, uh, but I didn't think the article was very good. Like, I'm not going to read it out, like, but... You know when someone's like just picking and choosing what they want to say about like his whole process, um. But here, look, it was it was just a hit job. Like it wasn't. I'm not even gonna do the author any 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 justice. Uh, by uh, reading out the article, but I don't I don't know how you couldn't look at at David's work and not think that there is something paranormal or supernatural going on here. Absolutely. How could you not, you know? Well, you know, it's just like uh, all these years and and uh, we everybody has waited for years and years and years for the U.S. government to say, yes, UFOs are, are real. And until they do that, there's always these skeptics. Well, they have done that and, now, actually. Yeah. They, well, have, yeah, they have admitted well, UFOs are real, but... They're not saying where they're coming from. Uh, right. Was there anything else you wanted to bring up, Ted, before we go? No, I I, I think we covered all the notes I had made here. I, I find uh, uh, Missing 411 very credible. Uh, I, I, I think David uh, does an excellent job. I think he's a, a serious investigator who really is trying to be very fair, but yet at the same time, I feel he's trying to help all of us wake up a little more to the reality of what's right here, right under our nose, that we we're, we're, can't see the trees for the forest. Oh, Anna, yes, Anna, Anna uh, she made a very nice contribution that I think was uh, absolutely wonderful. And Anna, God bless you. We thank you very much, very much appreciated. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, it's much appreciated. Thank you. Um, there was also a question from Sweet Cakes. Let me just find it. Hang on. Okay, so there's a question here from Sweet Cakes. Where we go, um, Sweet Cake. Sorry. Ted mentioned that he thought we were being manipulated by a stronger power in the Uglies episode. Any idea to what end? And can he elaborate a little more on this? Okay. Um, uh, tell me again. <laughs> so T Ted mentioned that he thought we were being manipulated by a stronger power in the Uglies episode. All right. So that was the episode with uh, uh, Diane. Okay, and then any idea to what end? So why are we why are we being manipulated by the stronger power? And can you just elaborate on it a bit? Okay, uh, what I meant by that was a lot of metaphysical people for years, and I have read in, in books, and I have heard metaphysical people actually uh, verbally say this in my presence that we are living a lie. We are living in a grand deception on this planet of what it's really all about. And I agree with that 100%. I think we have no idea that the real world is going on beyond our physical, earthly comprehension. And we are being manipulated just uh, as, as uh, I see world wars happening manipulated by an unseen force 
so that they can reap the harvest of all of the miles and miles of pain and agony that wars bring to people. And that was what I was talking about. We are, our whole lives are being manipulated on planet Earth and we can't see it. Yeah, okay. Um, I was, yeah. What about uh, with your life directly, though? Because um, I think in that episode, we were talking about how uh, you and Diane came to meet and then you let lost contact and then me and you started doing the podcast and all of a sudden Diane's available again. Yeah. To tell the story. Yeah. Uh, okay. I, I did feel bad because the, the, here was this woman I'd never met before who uh, we had a friend in common who calls and says, uh, she wants to, uh, Diane wants to meet with you because her her little four-year-old daughter is having abduction experiences and she thinks she has uh, seen you and so we arranged for us to get together when we do of course the the four-year-old girl recognizes me immediately uh i i feel sure i recognized her as as, as well but I think at the moment I was in sh such shock of what of the reality of what was unfolding in front of me with this information that uh, I I just was frozen, uh, and I can't say that I hundred percent recognized her, but I would say ninety five percent of me recognized her. Uh, so yeah, that was a manipulation behind the scenes of, of, of this child and I experienced this event, and then it materialized into into our earthly being here where we got together to confirm each other's experiences and, yeah. and then after we did that and that was on record from other people then uh years later when you and i start doing this podcast all of a sudden Diane and the story resurfaces in my life so that we can tell our tell that story again so I see that as manipulation by a power bigger than we are that we we don't we can't control or or we don't fully understand. Yeah, see, my problem with that is because you know I feel like my thoughts are my own, and at what point is it that like someone kind of does an inception on you? You probably don't know what inception is, do you? No. <laughs> uh, at some point, someone plants a seed in your mind to do something you know mm -hmm. and uh like i feel like my thoughts are my own <laughs> do you feel like yours well, are your own do you ever feel like oh I, I, the they are your own but uh as they're your own that they can create an experience to manipulate where the direction your thoughts are going okay um well i guess that uh answers your question sweet cake then Anything else you want to say before we go? No, I just want to remind everybody, clean up behind yourselves out here in our big, beautiful world. Keep the beaches clean, the mountains clean, the lakes clean, the rivers clean. It's, this is our home, people. Don't forget it. But if you are out cleaning up in those mountains, don't be lost in line. No, don't get lost. No, don't be last in line. <laughs> and don't get lost either. That's it. All right. Till the next time, listeners.